growing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor. So welcome to the, uh, the high-level uh, panel on uh, blended um, investment. I think many of you would have seen a lot of different conversations, a lot of different discussions around the role that institutional investors um, are playing in terms of mobilizing capital at scale. I think we saw during COP26 a very heavy focus on $130 trillion being lined up for, for, for climate-related projects, um, c commitments to net zero, but there was a very clear caveat. The caveat stated very clearly that de-risking needs to happen and the most appropriate um, government-owned institutions to affect that de-risking to crowd in uh, private capital at scale um, is the MDB uh, community. So everyone on this panel here has got deep and vast um, personal uh, institutional experience and exposure to what we believe is the catalytic role that uh, multilateral development banks can play in terms of crowding in uh, private capital at scale and de-risking private capital um, at scale. And I think we want to separate them out just a little bit because there's a, a longer term role. We often see the de-risking conversation focus on a transaction or a program but I think what you're seeing here is long-term investors um, and we're all working to affect a long-term transition so there's a much bigger strategic opportunity rather than de-risking a project or de-risking a program you're actually de-risking a geography's transition from emerging to no longer emerging and, and as a consequence you're affecting in a positive way at the risk profile. So joining me on this panel, I'm delighted to say, as I mentioned, we've got some great experts, Marc-Andre Blanchard, um, who heads up the sustainability team on a global basis at CDPQ, effectively one of the largest uh, institutional infrastructure investors uh, on the planet. So we're grateful to have you here, Marc-Andre. Um, we also have uh, Franny uh, Lutia. Um, many of you know her, she's worn so many different hats, it's gonna be great to get her views being with government, being with the IFC, being with the African Development Bank, now working with asset owners and the investment management uh, community. And she also chaired the G20's uh, capital adequacy framework review process, um, which is being revered um, across, um, across uh, the market. We also have to her right Faith Ward, who is the chair of the Institutional Investors Group on uh, Climate Change. And she's also the chief um, responsible investment officer at uh, Brunel uh, Pension Partnership um, in the UK. And then we have uh, uh, Peter Damgard Jensen, who is the co-chair of uh, Climate Investment Coalition and the former CEO of the Danish pension fund uh, PKA. And he's also an advisory board member of the African uh, Green Infrastructure Investment Bank. So I'm, I'm really just gonna jump straight into this. And Mark andre I think this is an open question uh, for all. I don't think in the last 24 months we've seen such a united voice, such a clinical focus uh, on investors making calls and being prescriptive to MDBs about the types of institutional, operational and governance changes we feel could catalyze private capital at scale. And I know that you've all touched on this. I'd be really interested to get your views about what your organization is doing in that particular area, what, what the highlights are, what the motivations were, uh, and what the expectations are in terms of how you are seeking to have a, a different strategic relationship with the MDBs in the context of that reform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hubert. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I, I just want to say an honor to be on this uh, panel. So what, what was uh, done recently by the, the, you know, many times it was said uh, to the private sector, to the institutional investors, uh, well, we don't know what you want. What, do, what would it take for you to invest in some frontier markets? And, um, you know, you're never there. Um, all of the criticism you've heard. So 
we really pushed on that and said and we came out uh, whether through SMI, ILN, uh, GISD, all of the groups where the private sector are and the institutional investors and said there are five things we want and amongst those five the most important one are we need the risking instruments that are at scale from either the MDBs or from uh, uh, development finance institutions from uh, FinDev Canada or the FC in the US or others. The second thing, we need, we need better, uh, we need a, a project development platform that we, the institutional investors, can access. At the moment, there's a lot of project development going on in terms of technical assistance to the countries, to the governments, to make sure that they have the investable environment. There's a lot of it, at, there's some of it at the World Bank, but there's none that is accessible to the institutional investors. And this is, a, this is a big market failure where we need uh, project development in a wide sense of the term, being accessible to institutional investors. Just to give you an idea, at the World Bank, there are, uh, what is it, 18,000 people who work there. There are 70, seven people, 17 people. Uh, 18,000 work there, 17 people total are focused on project development. This if you want a reform of the MDBs without having a, you know, a big a bread and wood meeting again, just put more money on the, on the project development and that would be of great help. The third thing that is very important is the actually the, the access, the World Bank and the other MDBs have a lot of information about the markets. And that's a great way to help us institutional investors to de-risk ourselves. So the GEMS database that exists at the World Bank should be accessible to all of us. There should be way more transparency about what has worked, what has not worked, what has been the return, and, and all of that. And that would help us actually better understanding the risk. You know, when you don't understand the risk, you, over, you tend to overestimate the risk, underestimate the opportunities. And you know, I, I, the, the, the gentleman that was there before was in his report said, you know, Africa, Africa faces pushback from investors due to a perceived lack of bankable projects. I've asked the gentleman, is it perceived or it's real? Mm -hmm. We believe it's real. So if the perception that we have, the belief that we have is wrong, well, let's work together. We all recognize the growth of the African continent. We all recognize there are opportunities there. The problem is we have no experience in this market for all of the reasons, good and bad. But let's assume that we all start there. So we need help as institutional investors to better understand. We're willing to do our part, but we need partners. And there are many ways to de-risk ourselves, not only the MDBs. I'm, you know, sometimes more hopeful with other sources of de-risking, like local partners that we co-invest with, governments that we can actually create platform with, young entrepreneurs with technology that we can actually work with. All of these things and, and, and some family offices that could be very helpful. So there are many ways of de-risking ourselves. Yes, with the MDBs there are some steps, but there are other ways to do it as well. And we need to work on all of the legs of the stool at the same time. Fantastic. Now, thank you very much, Marc-Andre. Working on all the legs of the stool, and it's clearly incumbent upon us as a continent or emerging markets um, to set out our stool and communicate that in a, in a consistent and, and clear way. So I know, Franny, that's um, been part of your, your, your basic existence for many years, public sector, private sector, the institutional investment community. But listening to what Marc-Andre said, how would you draw a distinction or complement that with your, you know, when you chaired that panel for the G20 on the capital adequacy reforms at the MDBs? Well, thank you, Hubert, and it's a pleasure to be here once again. You always organize these amazing events, so thank you for inviting me. Um, we were created as a panel under the G20 presidency of Italy because uh, there was a recognition that all the things we are talking about here need huge amounts of capital to come forward, and the capital resides mostly in the capital markets, and the multilateral development banks are the most efficient vehicle to transfer capital from the markets into the needs of the emerging economies and developing countries. 
So the question is, are they doing that? Are they doing it efficiently? And if not, what can be done for them to effectively play that role? Because they were created for that purpose. After the Second World War, with the countries in Europe destroyed, that was the, the purpose of the multilateral development banks. And then they became, after reconstructing France, they became useful for the rest of the world, right? So that was the purpose. So our panel uh, looked at the issue. We said, okay, we're going to throw away all the old ideas and we're going to look at it from first principles, basic principles. And we came up with a, a set of five recommendations. Mark andre had five <laughs> <laughs> recommendations five. as well. Five is the High magic five. number. Yeah. And um, we were looking at uh, 15 multilateral development banks, including the World Bank, uh, which is the largest one. And we found that, first of all, the reason why the multilateral development banks are not doing what they're supposed to do at that speed and at that scale is coming from their shareholders, the countries that own those banks, who tell them, yes, I want you to invest in development, but I don't want you to lose your triple A, and I don't want you ever to come to me to call on callable capital. So the MDBs are kind of strong, right? They, they have this mandate, but their shareholders are kind of holding the line. So our first recommendation is that the shareholders, who are the ones who appointed us, so it was a bit cocky for us to say that, should reinterpret the risk appetite of themselves and the instruction they give to the MDBs. Our second recommendation was on callable capital. The MDBs are unique creatures, if they didn't exist, we would have to create them because they have this very efficient structure where they have a small amount of paid in capital and a huge amount of callable capital. But the callable capital is done in a way where it is never called. And our, our panel reviewed and looked at what would happen in such a way that capital would be called and it's a very rare event. So we said, so why not take a small portion of that and use it to bring in more capital into those MDBs. And we found out that the Inter-American Development Bank is already doing it, and therefore this could be expanded to the other MDBs. Our third recommendation links a lot to what Mark Andre just said, which is innovation. He said they, there are a lot of ways in which the MDBs can tap into the private sector, and we looked at examples and said, now how do you take this to scale? Guarantees insurance. Why is MIGA only an insurer for the World Bank? It could be an insurer for all the MDBs. That's one of our recommendations. Our report is public, by the way, so you can see it. Uh, it's uh, on the uh, G20 website. Uh, you can find it on our website at Southbridge as well. And uh, many other innovations, including uh, hybrid capital, uh, uh, non-voting capital where institutional investors, the private sector can invest in the MDBs put for impact purposes but they don't participate in the governance structure which the shareholders are very, very uh, keen on keeping. And so that set of uh, innovations could unlock a lot of potential. And then the fourth block of uh, uh, recommendations was around the credit rating agencies. As we said, the credit rating agencies, they are very busy, they are rating thousands and thousands of commercial banks and a handful of MDBs. So the methodologies that they use are more fine-tuned for commercial banks than for MDBs. Mm -hmm. So our recommendation was that uh, the rating agencies should also look at their own methodologies and make adjustments. Mm -hmm. We were quite worried when we said that because, as you know, they are independent entities. So as soon as our report came out, Fitch came up with an opinion which was quite scary to the MDB saying, if you go and implement these recommendations, you will be downgraded. But then SNP and Moody's came up with their opinions and they both said, look, there's, we expect the MDBs to do all, if not more, more than what is in the report. And we don't see anything in there that would cause a downgrade. Mm -hmm and that we are willing to look at our methodology. So that was very encouraging to us. Mm -hmm. And our last recommendation was on data governance. And I think Mark andre already mentioned GEMS. Mm -hmm. GEMS is this database. It's a mine of beautiful information that the private sector would love to have its hands on to, to gauge risk, that the rating agencies would love to have their hands on to rate properly. But right now, it's a private database 
only known to the MDBs. So we recommended that that get publicized and available, maybe with some cleaning of the data to issue statistics rather than actual data, because it's, it has some sensitive market information. Um, and then we, within that block of data governance, we also recommended an MDB financial forum, because the MDBs don't have a place where they go and talk to each other. But they have so a pavilion. They have a pavilion, <laughs> yes, but we are asking them to do more to kind of engage with each other. So that was the report, and uh, I'm very grateful to the government of Italy who nominated us, uh, the governments of France and South Korea who are the co-chairs of the International Financial Architecture Working Group, the government of Indonesia, who was the host for the G20 this year, mm -hmm. and now the government of India is taking over for the presidency in the coming year. And they are all, it's, it's the one report that has enjoyed success from three consecutive G20 presidencies. And that tells you how important the MDBs are. Fantastic. No, thank you very much, Franny. Well, I'm hoping that that one report will be sort of merged with all of our sort of views and that we can really collaborate more constructively um, with the implementation of, of those reforms. And I'm now coming to you, Faith, and it'll be great that you can just pick up on what you've heard from, from other colleagues, add to it, change it. Um, Violent agreement is one thing, but love to hear your views. Thank you, Hubert, and, and thank you very much for the invitation um, to speak today, because I think, um, and really, uh, many of the points have been made that we're, we're hearing. So um, I'm chair of the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change, um, a European investor organization dedicated to accelerating transition. We have over, over 375 members representing 60 trillion, and we're hearing um, these sort of messages, these, these ask. I mean, Mark Andre really did summarize, I think, uh, and beautifully captured the kind of the messages we're hearing around kind of the de-risking, about the communication, the access to expertise, about being able to come up with solutions that are really accessible to all sorts of investors and, and making it super practical. So we're hearing, we're hearing this. I kind of feel that it's kind of work in progress. Mm -hmm. uh, we know we have examples, and, and I'm sure um, Peter, because many of those examples are from, from Denmark, including the PKAs, mm -hmm. um, has done some great innovations in this area. But really, we only have a handful of examples to draw on. We have, we have this. This is we are doing nowhere near enough in this area. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, but I think we're very self-aware of that. Um, I think what I hear is the need for courage. I mean, the idea that you need to be worried about being marked down because you're going to do the right thing as a development bank, it's sort of so frustrating. We live in a world of risk and reward. If mm -hmm. we don't take a risk, we're not going to get the reward. Mm -hmm. And the reward in this instance is obviously not just the financial opportunity, but, you know, essential climate action. So, you know, we, we do need to kind of um, find mechanisms to really break down these barriers. I mean, I think if I had to, uh, to summarize a couple of things just to add into the mix, what we're looking for from uh, policymakers, from regulators um, within, um, so to get that pipeline, is to have really clear objectives in from your country and make sure those go right from the top down to the local government. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the uh, projects we'll be doing will be at that sort of local level, so we need that local government to be just as aligned and as national governments and, and vice versa to make sure it's all, it's a very coherent program from top to bottom. Um, we need different sorts of um, structures uh, to operate using different, there's, there's a whole variety of financial instruments we can use and we need to sort of access all of those uh, so we can uh, t tap in to that private finance across that sort of asset spectrum. Um, and finally, I think a, a call probably to the IMDBs is, is the, um, the, the need for that you really need to kind of understand kind of the investor voice a bit more strongly. I think sometimes there's quite um, frustration mm -hmm. that investors are being apathetic, whereas in fact they've structured a deal that just doesn't allow us to access it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's about breaking down those barriers, actually speaking to each other and better understanding each other's needs so that we can um, see that cooperation, as you said, Hubert, I mean, it's absolutely essential mm -hmm. if we're actually to make any real progress on this and just not assume that the language of a development bank is the same as a, a pension for under an endowment. We do talk very different languages in terms of risk and return, and we need to break some of those barriers. But um, I'm going to hand over to Peter, because I say they, yes. they've done some of the most innovative no, no, um, Fantastic. Stuff. And no, no really great points, um, uh, Faith. And I think Marc Andre is, is, is known for this classical line, which sort of sets into context. When the MDBs started, they were several volumes times larger in terms of capital. Than, than, than the private capital markets. Now, today, we are, as the 
institutional investment community 900 times larger. So, the, so it begs the question, do we invert and have a different strategic relationship as the institutional pools of capital directly with governments who are the, the shareholders, ultimately the, the, the supreme governors of the MDBs? And I think today we launched, and you may have seen, in, in the, our own institutional investor public partnership model law, which suggests that institutional investors can have a direct relationship um, with governments as you know owners of public assets versus owners of private assets figuring out a more programmatic at scale uh, approach so those are really good points thank you very much and, and Peter yeah I, I always remember how simple um, you made it when I asked you how, how did you get the six Danish pension funds to invest a billion dollars into a transport fund for Africa and you said something about I took my trustees on a plane or they got on the plane and went to Africa. You've got to see the market. I mean, it's, uh, it, you're going to put consultancies and consultants out of work with that simplicity. But anyway, love to hear your views on the same subject. <laughs>
then actually you could, you could in some cases say, why should the development banks be there if not for crowding in private capital? Mm -hmm. They should take the more risky projects and then crowd in capital in the less risky projects. So we have to develop some kind of working relation between private investors and development banks on who is working uh, where. And the other thing I would mention uh, was actually, I think we need both blended uh, capital uh, instruments and we need guarantees. But we should also be aware that we could have too many that each country and each development bank develops his or her kind of uh, um, institute, a way of doing it. It becomes too if you're a small investor, but also for large investors. So working together, get fewer programs or get fewer ways of doing it is where we are today because we have tried, we have had successes, but not enough. Peter, I want to stay with you because we're just going to come back and just have this sort of last round. And it's, it's, the, uh, it's the very controversial thing, the thing that some of us think and, and, and others don't, um, don't say. There's a key issue, which is, in terms of private capital mobilization, the ratios that the MDBs deliver are extremely poor. If they were to be reviewed within a private institution, you probably wouldn't hire that institution again. You probably wouldn't hire that client again. Are we trying hard to keep them relevant um, and perhaps propping them up as a consequence? Or should we be thinking about putting out that same mandate about what we actually require into the private market? I know it's a bit controversial, and let us all end on that. Uh, so perhaps let's come back this way, if you like. Uh, is, is there room for both in the market? Maybe should we, to keep each other honest? I, I think there's room for both. Uh, and I also think there's the room for, and, and the first one have started, there's uh, there room for renewable uh, uh, renewable investor groups, uh, private equity groups working in this market and specializing in this market. But they also have to be some uh, 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 dividends of, of work. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned, uh, the development banks have to take the more risky projects and work with them. And they have to, what we also have heard, they also have to take care of the development of new products together with governments. That's, you can't do that as a private investor. Um, I think we have to have much more private investments and, and by that maturing the market. But we are not, not near, uh, nearly where we are in the developed world, world where you just can say the private sector will drive this and take over. We were in the same situation in the developed market in the green sector five, six or seven years ago, but it took nearly uh, 10 years to, to get really a genuine market all over the developed world. Right. Thank you very much. Over to you, Faith. Mm. Yeah, no, quite a controversial yeah. question. I you think you um, didn't have any um, dinners planned with the World Bank this evening, <laughs> did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I'm going to go with Peter and go uh, a place for both. I think where we know that um, investing in emerging markets requires deep expertise, and I think that's one of the points that, that uh, Mark Andre put, picked up there about access to, to, to that and, and really supporting investors in doing that. And that's where the development banks really could have that role. They've got feet on the ground. They understand the uh, communities in which they operate. They need to leverage that expertise. They also need to respect the expertise, I'd say more from my experiences with talking to development banks, um, of the investor community and the expertise that we have. And I think it's about collaboration and cooperation together and making the best of those skill sets that we respectively have. Um, and so therefore, a place for both, respect, uh, needs to be mutual from both and see how we can really mobilize this action because I mean uh, it, it comes to the end of the day I mean we are talking about we are it, it, it is it we need a lot of capital to I mean as you said the numbers are absolutely huge so we, and we've got to get a wiggle on and um, so we can't just keep sort of having this sort of going round in circles there has to be some breakthroughs there absolutely thank you um, I would say that um, MDBs have a unique role for counter cyclical times so we need the MDBs for that because nobody else plays that role when the world really goes bad, when everyone is hurting. Mm -hmm. However, it is true that over the years, when I was at the World Bank, uh, every dollar that the World Bank spent leveraged $10 from the private sector. Now I
it's about 10 cents. Mm. So the, it has flipped uh, dramatically. And the reasons are, are multiple, but one of them, and I think this is where the partnership comes in, I think the MDBs do the best job in preparing the ESG components of investment projects. So the private sector could benefit a great deal by uh, getting uh, those, and that's one of our recommendations, to have the World Bank and other MDBs prepare those projects, handle all the ESG issues, which are very complex. They need government intervention, community engagement. They are long-term. They have to take risk, as Peter has said. But then they can offload those portfolios to the private sector. We've done two at the African Development Bank already, one where, while I was there and another one recently where in, in, in private investors were able to take a portfolio from the African Development Bank and, and, and handle it from then on. So I think there's an opportunity for partnership there and institutional investors can do a lot with it. But the third aspect, I believe, is by using what only the MDBs have, which is called preferred creditor status, because the MDBs have a unique situation with the governments with whom they work. There's not a government that ever defaults to an MDB, but they default to the private sector. So you can use that preferred creditor status as a value to generate more room on the balance sheets of the MDBs. And in the studies that we did for this independent report, we found that the difference between an MDB's risk outturn on a portfolio and a private sector outturn for the exact same country, if you look at the bond markets, for instance, is 14-fold, which means the MDBs have a risk lower by 14 times for the same country than a private investor. So that is a value that could be brought in this partnership uh, I think doing what Peter and uh, Beth were suggesting we do. Thank you. Great, great points, Rani. And those two examples that you gave in terms of the African Development Bank, the, the room to run $1.2 billion securitization, what was it that made the difference in terms of the institutional investors coming in? Access to gems. Access to gems. Access to gems, case in point. Um, and so we just close off with you, uh, bookend with you, Mark andre Hubert, I just you want to say, all the above? I oh. agree with everything that was <laughs> said. One thing we, one missed, is there's a role for everyone in this and we have to recognize that institutional capital like pension funds like the one i represent have a different tolerance to risk than an mdb can do we all have a role the problem that is now that we all need to realize is that mdbs are very small we need to make sure that their capital is as leveraged as, as much as possible, is used for really what they sh should be used for, and that actually we develop tools and mechanisms to uh, get the institutional capital in. I always say there's been a revolution in the last 70 years, three revolutions, globalization, technology, and who owns and who controls capital. And it, it's institutional investors like me who controls more or less half of all of the investable capital in the world. Yet, there's no mechanism, no tool, nothing that is catering to us to actually invest where the risk return equation is not right for our fit, to meet our fiduciary obligation. And that's the, the, the thinking that needs to change in all of this debate. It's not one to the exclusion of the other. It's actually, let's, w this is 2022 and soon 2023. And it's urgent that we all act together. Thank you. And with those uh, strong words, uh, please join me in thanking uh, uh, Peter, Faith, uh, Franny, and Mark for those excellent contributions. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.